And we are live. What's up to anyone who is listening? We've got Jeremiah Zimmerman coming in very shortly. Going to be talking about the work of Morton Feldman. One of the greatest artists, I don't know, ever to live. Something like that. Um, we're, uh, I'm in a different room than normal because uh, there's, they're just going buck wild with this leaf blower out back. And um, what's up, Philip? But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm on uh, Wi-Fi today instead of, oh shit, Zach. I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be on Wi-Fi today instead of the Ethernet. So there's, there, might be some, there might be some little crackles and stutters and whatnot. But uh, just like this is, this is what it's like when you are doing stuff at home and not at some crazy podcast studio or whatever. Um, that'll be the next step like taking this to some, you know, nicely soundproof room or like renting out, uh, you know, by the hour. Um, I could do that actually now. It's not like that expensive, but then I have to like lug all my shit over there. Um, what's up, Brett? <clears throat> yeah, we've been, I've been listening to a ton of Feldman this week and so has, so has Jeremiah. We've been like, uh, we've been like talking a little bit, um, Philip says that Joe De, De Rienzo is a is a was a Feldman student, and uh, Philip says that he was a mentor. That uh, that Feldman student Joe De Rienzo is a, something of a mentor to him. So that's that's cool. The whole um, <laughs> thanks, Aaron. The whole thing of um, by the way, yeah, the whole thing of stu uh, stu uh, studying with someone who was a student of someone who was a student with someone. This kind of like lineage. Uh, my, my dad told me, so check this out. When I was a kid, I, I took piano lessons from this guy, David James. Okay. Who's like, he's not like some famous teacher. He's just like a good, you know, teacher in Manhattan, right? Piano teacher came to my house. We did a little Mozart, Chopin and stuff. So David James, he studied with this guy, Robert Schrade. Robert Schrade studied with, I can't remember how it goes. It's like Leon Fleischer. And then you go back a few generations and uh, so then someone studied with uh, Cherney, who did, who was like famous for all these exercises. Two generations back from that, Beethoven. So basically, I studied with Beethoven. Several generations. Could you imagine just piano lessons with Beethoven? He's like annoyed because you're eating shit. You like didn't study. You didn't practice. Um, he can't hear you anyway. Wah, wah. Um, yeah, I want to say I'm psyched about everyone uh, being up in the Discord. What's up, Juan? Got Anna Cat in the house. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm pumped about the Discord. We launched it this week, Last Things Discord. Um, it's already really vibrant. We got a sick handful of people in it. And um, everyone's sharing work. Everyone's you know, commenting on each other's stuff. It's like really, really positive, wholesome stuff in there. Um, no beefs, no one getting banned, no cancellations. We'll see though. We gotta, we gotta make that happen. We need a little drama, like a couple months. In a couple months, we'll get the drama happening. Um, who was the composer I said before Beethoven? Um, Ch Cherney, like C Z E R. N-E-Y, I think. You could look it up. That's like someone who invented these really famous piano exercises, the Cherney exercises. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So yeah, if any anyone watching this after the fact, uh, if you want to be on the, that's right, if you want to be on the Last Things uh, Discord server, find a way to hit me up. I'm not going to post the link here because I do want to still have a little bit of that filter of like, you have to reach out to me. To, it's not like there's any, um, it's not like there's any audition process or the, the only, I keep saying that the only vetting process for the last thing server is just to make sure that you actually really want to do it and aren't just going to click on the link randomly. That's all. Um, but yeah, track me down on Instagram, Facebook, something. Instagram's probably best or Twitter. Twitter is the best. Track me down hit me up for that link and I'll link you in to the discord. Um, <clears throat> word. Let's, um, let's bring Jeremiah in cause there he is. There's the man. What's up, dude? Am I in? You're in. Dude. Check, check. You're can in. you hear me? 
I can hear you since I'm 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 on a different uh, audio interface today and all this stuff. Uh, I can't hear how loud I am. So if anyone in the good. chat, yeah, from my perspective, good. you sound good. Yeah, you, you sound good to me. Uh, let let me know, people in the in the in the chat, if um if one of us is like way louder than the other, something like that. But it should be pretty evenly matched. How you feeling today, man? Good. I'm a little uh like zoned out in the in the in the feld mania like i've been you know as as you mentioned a second ago at the top of this thing like you know i mean basically since i'm 21 years old i've been listening to feldman with great regularity and the last you know since you you know texted me like a week ago i've been listening uh not only to the pieces that i'm super familiar with but you know i, I realize i actually have a lot of blind spots with feldman specific specifically like middle period feldman like same, I, I found same. that um, the stuff that I've, I'm most drawn to in Feldman, the stuff that I've listened to the most and uh, the, uh, repeatedly is like early, early and late, late. Um, same for me, man. Exactly the same. The middle gets lost. It's it gets lost to me. a lot of people. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that true? Or is that like? Well, I, I just don't hear. It's like, I mean, middle period, people talk about Rothko Chapel, which we're going to talk about. Right. But, um, but like, uh, but yeah, other than that, uh, I, people, I don't hear a ton of people or viola in my life. Is that middle period? Yeah. I, that, and that's actually one I've listened to quite a lot. I guess I should also say is that I'm m far more familiar with the music for small ensembles than any of the orchestral stuff. Um, I, oh, I've word. listened to it, uh, like, you know, Coptic light, which I know is a really important piece to you. Um, that's man. Yeah. But it doesn't occupy the same part of like my baked in fiber that say a piece like um, Rothko Chapel or or uh, Patterns in a Chromatic Field or um, uh, Only is one of my favorite pieces ever. And that's like one of his earliest pieces. Don't even know it, man. Don't even know it. It's a piece for solo voice that I think Joan LaBarbera... Like, have you ever heard that record called um, Three Voices for Joan LaBarbera? That piece I know, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know that piece. I heard, um, I met Daisy Press when she performed that with two pre-recorded tracks of her singing at, uh, at like Trans Picos on a Tuesday night. <laughs> it was like <laughs> so sick. <laughs> Just like, so good. I feel like, I mean, have you, have you had, uh, much experience listening to Feldman's music performed live? A little bit, man. I mean, I, I, it's, it's, I'm embarrassed to say I can't remember what string quartet what what ensemble performed this but at, when i was in college at wesleyan they did someone did a performance of the the, the second string quartet the one that's mm -hmm. like whatever it is like four six hours or something six hours yeah six hours and they had like um yeah they did it in like one of the art gallery buildings of the you know with like uh, pillows on the floor and stuff so you know you're allowed to be a human being and like not just sit sit in a hard chair and listen for six hours i don't think i made it through all six hours I no I, I i went i think it was like 2010 maybe they did uh flux quartet did that at um issue project room and i made it through about an hour and a half of it i i, I didn't have any goal or expectation that i would sit from beginning to end i knew i wouldn't so I yeah i know felt if i doesn't yeah if I did 90 minutes, you know, I, I felt like I had heard the piece in, um, live. But, I've only, you know, I was thinking about it in the last few days, and I've only heard his music performed in concert, in person, a, uh, a couple of times. And it's not – I don't know that, you know, unlike a lot of music, I don't know for me personally that I, I receive, like, a much larger benefit from hearing it live than I do on a recording. I like being, this music specifically, I like being as close to the sound as possible. Um, and I, I, I texted this to you the other day. I feel like if Feldman was like of our generation, I think he'd be like really into listening to music on headphones and having his music. I know, yeah, you said that. I, I, no, I totally, no, I totally think so. I totally think so. Um, although his vibe, I mean, he is into like performance. Mm -hmm like uh you know not playing the music completely precisely so that, yeah he definitely is into some level of performance but like but yeah as far as right like just being on headphones like solitary with the perfect sound like i bet yeah i bet he would be into that i just i mean there's so much like this is going to sound really trite and, and cliche perhaps but like so much of 
I, I would say any given Feldman piece, um, at least the ones that I'm more familiar with, like, I, I don't I don't just want to say that, you know, the silence is just as important as, you know, the content, but like, the oh, decay- man, I'm getting uh, what? I'm getting fucked up by the by the wireless here. Oh, there you uh, go. There you are. I'm, am I back? Yeah, there's going to be some of that today. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. But any case, yeah. Wait, sorry, go ahead. No, I, no, I was just going to say, though, that like the not the sign, not necessarily the silence in the music, but the decay. And the way that you hear, uh, like the different sonorities, sort of interact in the decay itself. Like, I, I can't imagine, like, you know, the Feldman piano music that I know pretty well. Like, I can't imagine that music being performed without the sustain pedal. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, man. Well, that. Remember, there was something about, yeah, two things about that. With Coptic Light, when he was talking about Coptic Light, he said the whole point of the piece was that he wanted to, he was thinking about what if the orchestra had a pedal. Right. If the whole orchestra had like a pedal and a sustained pedal and stuff, which is like, I mean, just to even think that, it's like it, you're already deep. And then to actually make that and do that, I, you know? And yeah, and I mean, and another thing to that is that uh, the stuff I'm reading, he ke- he keeps talking about sounds dying, like, right. uh, you know, like falling away, and almost uh-huh. like this gr- this grieving, this this grieving of sound, like mourning sounds, like dying, you mm-hmm. know. It doesn't yeah. sound like, you know, tradition. It doesn't sound like triumphant music. I, I think you know. I oh, think. No. <laughs> like I, I initially oh, no. one of many reasons that like I was drawn to his music, um, like per, you know for me early on and and what was immediately compelling was largely like the melancholy aspect of it, um, and not in any overt way. It's not like there's like this tremendous amount of like really like mournful melodies. I mean, there's some, but it's just the music itself. Like if you, I, I think that same impulse that um, draws people to like just emotional goth music even is like the same thing that might sort of like pull you into a, you know a Feldman piece I know like that's that's what's weird because it's like it's it's totally unromantic but yet super dark like uh as opposed you mean, you mean to... like unromantic in like the cl- the classical sense um both like romantic both, period like romantic period yeah right. I mean it's like uh it's completely detached from like well that's not that's debatable but i mean he's all about it being detached from you know per like uh this thing of being like it's all about the sound itself it's not mm-hmm. about narratives it's not about this like you know making a point or telling a story it's just about pure sound itself but like you know all of those guys in the new york school were about that to some extent and yet Feldman sounds like what you're saying. Like Feldman still ends up being like goth. Mm-hmm. I you know, <laughs> I, I don't, you know, I, I, I pulled up, you know, I was showing you like, I, I marked some quotes from some different interviews that uh, I felt yeah, like man. just thematically things that um, like I kept finding uh, in all the interviews with him. And, and this is me putting it this way. No, I'm not quoting him when I say this, but like, it seemed like it was really important to him every step of the way to sort of put as much like stink on it as possible and really have it, you know, the music, to me, the music of Feldman, you know, one of the first things I would say that, that I love about it, it's just like, it's really sensual. It's really like tactile. Like you, um, it, it, for me, it's very comforting. It's very much like a blanket. Um, but you know, there's, I was trying to find, I was, man, I, I drove myself crazy trying to find this, uh, audio interview of him that I used to have where he's talking about, um, his piano that he keeps at home and how he intentionally keeps it. He likes it out of tune. Uh, and in that like really thick Brooklynese of his, he says, um, he says this, this out of tune quality, it, uh, it enriched the color. It's warmer. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like I, I feel like the way he would his piano would sound, and this is pure, well, not pure speculation, but largely speculation. The way that he would experience the notes of his own piano sort of informed the way he would, ex- how he wanted the the instruments and their sonorities to sort of interact. Where it wasn't like you couldn't, like, uh, like with like a, a ruler, like write the exact semitones. It's like it's a little, it's a little more. Um, 
a little more ethereal, a little more uh, ephemeral, like how things kind of catch. And it, it makes it like very unique to the player and unique to the, in to the instrument, as he would say. <laughs> instrument. Yeah, yeah, that, that was something that I, I, um, I was hyped that you, uh, that you first off were like, let's talk about patterns in a chromatic field because I hadn't listened to that piece like uh, forever. And it's like, mm -hmm. just, it's like one of the best. It's un crushing. So for late period, I'm psyched with doing that one. Uh, and, and I hadn't really thought about how, um, yeah, Juan is asking, did Feldman ever do microtonal stuff? And that's the, you know, with this piece, it, it, that, that is a microtonal piece, patterns in a chromatic field. I mean, I was looking at the score a little bit and it's like the thing that like, um, well, actually I, I didn't, I didn't get to see the whole score, so I don't, that, but he's got, well, actually, you know what, let's, we'll get to that when we get to the piece. Um, but yeah. I've here's, always, here's, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, you go ahead, man. No, no, no. You're, you're about to make a point. No, I was going to sort of, I was going to like sort of lay out a plan. Um, I mean, I want to meander, but it is, I, it is good to sculpt things. Cause if we go too, if we go too meandering, I'm going to actually lose stuff that I want to sure. get to, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, let's, let's talk a little more about just like how we first got into Feldman and kind of like what that was about for us, you know, first getting yeah. into him and kind of the influence on our own stuff. And then, and then let's kind of like lay out the general issues that I kind of want to get to and then yeah. just go piece by piece. Does that sound? Yeah, that's, totally. Like how, how did you, pieces? like what's your, what's your early experience with Feldman? I mean, I can't remember whether it was Lucier in his intro to experimental music class. I can't remember. Hey, let, whether... let me just stop you for a second because you yeah. actually, this was a class that you personally attended with Lucier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. With Alvin Lucier, man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, for real. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Lucier was my faculty advisor. He would like sign my like drop ad slips and shit. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I'm very grateful. I've led, mm -hmm. I've led a, a charmed life, but, um, he, um, but yeah, it was, it was either in that class intro to experimental music and he played us durations. So it was either that or it was, uh, Chris Jonas, playing the Coptic light when we were hanging out. Did you ever know Chris Jonas? The name, I definitely know the name. Is he a bass player? Uh, no, he's a soprano sax player. And okay. he, he moved to Santa Fe and kind of moved out, you know, kind of left the, the world of like just hitting it hard career-wise and stuff. But uh -huh. I, think he still, I think he still does really interesting uh, stuff, collaborations with dancers and stuff. <laughs> anyway, amazing soprano sax player was part of this sort of William Parker, like late 90s kind of, seen in new york mm -hmm. and i kind of wanted to study with him because he's like this really amazing post braxton dude um dealing with improvisation and and, and classical music etc so anyway yeah so he played me coptic light that blew my fucking mind and then that and or lucier playing me durations i mean the thing for me that's weird is because like i i um i was thinking for this for this stream, I was like, man, like he's felt so important to me, but I was like, is, is his influence even audible in my stuff? Like, is it even evident in any way really? And most of it. And then I was thinking, you know what? It's in improvisation that that's where, that's where I'm dealing with Feldman, even when it's loud, actually, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. we play together, I'm dealing mm -hmm. with Feldman. When I play with Mike, um, that kind of clicked for me. I'm like, oh, right. That's where I'm processing the guy, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, Chris, Christian says, Chris Jonas is still composing. This is, What's I got to catch up with, I know Christian, how you doing, man? Yeah. We got to catch up with, um, I got to catch up with Chris Jonas, man. Cause he is, he is a really, really incredible, uh, yeah. talent, you know? Um, but yeah, man. So yeah, that was my intro. How did, oh no, actually, no, you know what, you know how I heard of, um, how I heard of Feldman first was through, uh, John, Z at John Zorn record, Redbird. Yeah. That's his yeah. like Feldman piece. Yeah, it's just a rip off, and I mean, yeah. it's just a, an homage. Like, it's really not the best Zorn piece, but if you haven't it's heard, it's one Feldman, of the more like, enjoyable. Oh my god, ones, you know, it's like I mean, it's like it's it's Feldman. Ah, you're breaking up a little bit. Sorry, can you hear me? There you are. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's. I mean, it's a Feldman piece. That that piece, yeah. Redbird, is you know, it's. I think he de dedicated it to um, to Agnes Martin. Um, yes. And, but that's a, that's, it's a Feldman piece. 
It's a Feldman. Ag- Agnes Martin is sick too, and I totally can get. I can totally see how Agnes Martin would be like in line somewhat with the Feldman thing or something. Yeah, like I that. think I actually yeah. I tr- I tried doing like a search to see to see if I could find some direct links between um, Feldman and Agnes Martin. You know, because a big you know I'm sure we'll kind of talk more about this, but you know you cannot talk about Feldman's work and Feldman the thinker and Feldman the artist without talking about his relationship to not just paintings but to painters like his yeah. his real his real peers his real contemporaries i think i mean i'm putting words in the mouth of history but like i i always got the impression that the people the the community of people with whom he really evolved his ideas about making work were with paint you know famously it's mm-hmm. you know John Cage and, and Earl Brown and shit but I think you know the the relationships with like Philip Guston and and Jackson Pollock, um, really sort of cemented the the stuff yeah. in Feldman's music that we know and love. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, how did how did you get into Feldman? What was your what was your intro to the man? In the, in the, in I mean, the the f- I don't I don't remember. You know, I it was during I, I've talked about this. You know, like on podcasts and stuff. I've talked about this period of of time in my life before where I was just like voraciously check you know where i was sort of like checking out as much crazy music as i could get my hands on largely from stuff i read in the wire magazine and sort of doing so without having any understanding of how these different musics like were not were quite frequently not the same thing so i was literally yeah. buying you know like albert eiler records um and morton feldman records um yeah. two you know hugely important artists for me um, but the first, the first record, the first Feldman music that I heard was the the Rothko Chapel. Uh, the 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 name of the trio, the Abel Weinant, and I can't think of the third uh, member of Steinberg, Abel Weinant Steinberg trio. That okay. recording, which I think by most standards is like the sort of the held in the highest regards, uh, certainly by me anyway. Is that uh, yeah? That's not the one that I I. I don't think that's the one that I know. I forget actually what 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 the ensemble is that I had the Rothko Chapel of. Um, yeah, th- that's really not my favorite Feldman piece, actually, by any stretch. Really, uh, I'm psyched to. I mean, I can't say I dislike it. I mean, it's gorgeous, but mm-hmm. yeah, for Feldman, that's really never been a, a thing. But I'm psyched to hear. Yeah, I'm psyched to get into it though. Well, um, I, you know, one thing about super important. I, so when we were texting the other day, there's this new version of or a new a new uh, realization of of Rothko Chapel that was just released on ECM, and I was telling you like I hate it, you know, I was like really yeah. like t- bummed out by it. But I think that's also just because I mean, I'm sure I have like an, an attachment to this initial recording. Um, but something that I, really bums me out about this new version, um, which is in stark contrast to what I really loved about the, the original one at the time, was that. Like with a lot of classical recordings, you know, the mics are always like, it's often like two mics in a hall and yeah. you don't really hear like the up close details of the instruments, but you do hear the ambient sounds. And with that recording, I always found it really difficult to hear like exactly what instruments were making, which, which sounds. Yeah. And that was always part of, part of like the magic to me. So on this new recording, you know, there's so many, like in the second movement, there's so many like moments where there's like a, a roll on a wood block that sort of like punctuates. Yeah. And, and in this new recording, I feel like Steve Schick is playing it like he's Dave Lombardo or something. It just like, it pops out. <laughs> it's too, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's some of my favorite stuff in that piece is the little wood block rolls, actually. That, uh, that's, yeah. so, that's, it's so sick. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man. <clears throat> yeah, let's talk, let's talk rations and then we'll talk Roth Chapel and then we'll talk, um, and then we'll talk uh, patterns in a chrome. Yeah, so we'll field. go in order. Yeah, let's let's go in order. Some some themes that I I, I want to touch on, like just and let let me know just topics that have been in your mind, like being ready for this. Like definitely time process as far as the process of composing, mm-hmm. with notation being sort of part of that. Um and. I, and I'm thinking about Hegel also, and it's like, this is not because I think about Hegel at all when listening to his music, but just because he keeps mentioning, he just rags on Hegel, which is a little, 
I mean, it can be kind of easy to do that, but maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe when he was doing it, it, it was like a little more edgy or something. But, um, but yeah, I want to talk, and I also, I'm always down to talk about what is, <laughs> what is Jewish or not Jewish about someone who is Jewish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We we've done that enough that I don't insist that we talk about that. Right. It's like right. you know, I'm 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 with it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what 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 is it like? like I guess we'll start with Hegel. Uh, what what was jumping out to you about Feldman, sort of deriding Hegel? Well, his whole thing. It, I'd be into talking about this in each piece. It, it's that he. Well, you sent me that quote. I, you know, Stockhausen believes in uh, Stockhausen believes in Hegel. I believe in God. Mm -hmm. Um. Feldman rails against dialectics. I mean, this is what he hates about Hegel. And the thing is, I, I'm I have really not read a ton of Hegel. I would never um I would I would not go on a live stream and start talking about Hegel specifically, but I do think that I have I probably have the same grip on Hegel that Feldman did. So I feel like right. I can talk about I can talk about him talking about Hegel, you know? Yeah. And um I know that he contradicts himself a lot, but I think his thing about being against dialectics is like he's seems to be against this idea of process, you know, like mm -hmm. overarching process. Like if Hegel, like if dialectics means this grand narrative of like a process of history, you're like moving forward. He's not into systems. I mean, this right. we know, right? He's yeah, really yeah, yeah. not into like overarching systems. And I mean, if you say you're against dialectics as a thing, then that means, I guess, that you're against opposites being reconciled, like opposites being reconciled into a new thing, you know? Mm -hmm. You're against this thing of like, oh, there's, there's antithesis, you know, thesis, and then the antithesis, and then they get synthesized into a new thing that then becomes the new thesis. I mean, he definitely is against that idea of like composing that way. Well, so um, he, I no. mean, I feel, I feel like, um, and you know, just to sort of like, you know, based on the criteria that you started with, you, I, I think there's like three quick things to note about that one. And if you, if you, any of you who are listening to this, if you don't have a copy of give regards, give my regards to eighth street, I, this is like, I would say one of the books Feldman aside, just like uh, by or about musical thinkers that I recommend the most highly. It's but, so good. You know, you certainly like very early on um it's you know it's a collection of essays it's a collection of, of lectures um he, he kind of like is constantly bad mouthing certain people yeah um and in a way for me it's really useful to kind of understand feldman um who he was and what his his ideas were against who those people were and like that to me yes. is like in a way very jewish like defining yourself <laughs> uh, against something Right, um, right, right. The two, like, yeah, the, the two synagogues. That one, I would not set foot. Right. Exactly. <laughs> right, right. But like one, the one, one figure that he really like kind of you know chooses to illustrate as like his antithesis a lot is Boulez. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I mark this, this, um, this, this one fragment in here where you know famously in the fifties, uh, he hung out a lot at this bar in Greenwich Village called the Cedar Tavern with a lot of the painters and a lot of the other musicians. Legends. <laughs> legendary yeah with the legends and he's talking about in this in this chapter called predeterminate slash indeterminate he's talking about the very last night the cedar tavern was open he went there with boulez and uh this is what he writes about boulez and it, it just to me it really demonstrates like this distaste for systems uh he says somehow it didn't seem right that i should spend that last evening with boulez who is everything i don't want art to be it is Boulez more than any composer today who has given system a new prestige. Boulez, who once said in an essay that he is not interested in how a piece sounds, only in how it is made. Yes. No painter would ever talk that way. Uh, Philip Guston once told me that when he sees a painting, when he sees how a painting is made, he becomes bored with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that. Yeah, he he feels that. Um... Yeah, he really feels that like um, composition, uh, yeah, that like just music, contemporary music hasn't caught up with painting in some way, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, but also uh, like he just he I, 
I cannot, you know, I, I go, I have like a couple, you know, books and shit that I pulled out, like trying to find really concrete, you know, he talks a lot about thing, you know, things that he feels like in opposition to, um, generally systems. I, it's like almost impossible for him to, to find like, re, for me to find like really concrete statements about what, um, uh, about his process. And it's just yeah. like, it's, it's a lot, he's very anti-system. Yeah, yeah, which which is interesting to me because I mean, like, if you're against systems, I mean, isn't that sort of like some dialectic, you know, between the systems and the anti-systems that then you're like synthesizing into a new thing? I mean, he, um, yeah, like this thing. Well, you know what? I also think about this is like not that deep, but I what I, I think about the thing of um, of like uh, of that you don't want to know how something's made. Like I think about food. Like mm -hmm. where it's just like if you eat a delicious croissant, like nobody is obsessed with how that got made at all. Nobody feels like they need to know that about food, you know, and yet somehow with experimental music, it's like everyone what you got if you want to know how the composer made it, you know, anyway. Well, you know, I mean, to, to draw like a food comparison, one of the things that like I really love about Feldman is the same thing I really love about a lot of food, which is like just the ingredients like he's not he's not interfering with the ingredients he's really letting them like if you ever yes. hang out with like a really talented chef or really talented cook even if it's in like a home kitchen and like as they're preparing food they'll be like here man taste this taste this blueberry these just came in from the farmer's market and you're like holy fuck like don't do anything to that you know what it mean yeah well yeah that's that's what because yeah he's always talking about um just how the materials the sounds themselves themselves like tell him what to do like he's always talking about that stuff like not pushing the sounds around yeah like letting the sounds dictate what they want to do exactly um, exactly he, so there's that's a, like what there's, you're talking about you know great ingredients there's a south there's a chef uh in south america f world famous um francis malman and he's always reminded me of feldman like physically they look the same and they have this same sort of like uh uh like larger than life aura and they have this like real emphasis on sensuality and you yeah. know food love women wine sound you know um and that's how malman is when you watch him cook he's like i'm gonna show i'm gonna t i'm gonna use a potato i'm gonna show you you know 40 things you can do with a potato you know not to make it not taste like a potato but to like really let the potato Yes. Yeah. Like bring, yeah. Let, yeah. Bring out the potato -ness, like do what the yeah. potato wants, wants you to do. Yeah, man. I mean, that's one deep thing. Th the thing about that system stuff is that like it, th these systems like serialism or something like that, which is really, he's, you know, he's reacting to that whole period, right? It's not just Boulez, it's not just Stockhausen, just the whole thing, just that yeah. whole time period where serialism and just grand systems are our king hmm. it's like when you have those like high tech like musical systems it, they they sort of uh they they aren't based in the materials they're, they're right. like a system that then you plug materials into yeah you know so it's like you know yeah you have the like the the tone row that could be played on any instrument um it's like not it's it's top down it's mm -hmm. not from the middle outwards. It's not from the material out. It's the top down, and then you plug in. Well, um, and Feldman, I mean, so. as far as I know, he always wrote for the instrument. The instrument was always, like, at the fore of his mind with any piece of music. And it was never, yes. like, f taking, you know, some, some progressions or some chords and then figuring out what the instrument is. It was always, you know, for the instrument. Right, yeah, this vibe of, like, yeah, when people, like, just take... Yeah, you just like assign the instrument to certain stuff. Like that's right. that's not deep. I mean, I I learned that the hard way a little bit writing some chamber music just on the level of just some shit. It's like not even that subtle, but literally just being like, oh, I'm gonna have the oboe play quietly like this low C, mm -hmm. middle C, and it's like it's not quiet. That's just not quiet on the oboe. It's loud right. inherently. So right. it's like, you know what I mean? If you put that on a flute, it's quiet as hell. So it's just like, I mean, that's not, that's not like deep Feldman shit. That's just like knowing how to write for hammer <laughs> instruments. But, um, but so even but a piece I like... learned from him that caution, you know, of just like, dude, yeah. what is it actually going to sound like, you know? So, so, okay. So you first heard durations in that class with Lucier or with Chris Jonas? Uh, I, I heard durations in the class. 
<clears throat> with Lucier. Yeah. And, and I, you know, the thing is, I definitely, this is the thing, you know, Feldman's all like, no, don't worry about systems and process and stuff. But I totally was introduced that piece in the context of being like, check out how this piece works, check out the process, mm -hmm. you know, which, which by the way, yeah, anyone. So I'm kind of assuming that people here, maybe some have heard Feldman, some haven't but there's some knowledge about contemporary music here or something. Um, I mean, durations, for anyone who doesn't know, the way that piece works is basically just all the musicians just have these bunch of notes that you play in a row, and you don't line them up with the other players. You play them for as long as you want, as long as it's slow and quiet. And everyone's stuff just lines up with each other how it lines up, you know? That's, that's when you when when you first heard the piece in that class, were you also looking at the score, or you were, it was just like a blind listening experience? I think it was blind listening experience, but I had been told that about the piece. Right, I think I had been I had been told how it works, you know, so that it's indeterminate to an extent. Right, but were there? Right. Do you? I, I I don't I don't think I've ever seen the score. Like, are there bar lines? Like, he's not. Uh, no. No, no. Right. Yeah, no, no, no. There's no bar lines or conductors, man. I mean, it's right. just like literally, it's just like play these. Yeah, it's like play, th go through these notes at any speed you want, as long as it's slow and quiet. And, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, yeah. Start together. Uh, some of there's durations one through six. A, a couple of them, you, you, you know, you don't have to start exactly together. Mm -hmm. um, but at least one of them, you know, the instructions say start at the same time then after mm -hmm. that it's not it's not uh it, yeah it's not it's not synchronized so i mean that to me like right aesthetically it bl it's blowing my mind like just because it's this quiet beautiful ambient thing that you know you never heard anything like it um except vabern is the closest thing and uh, i we'll, we'll, we should definitely talk about vabern a little bit but um yeah, there's the beauty and then just the thing of like, oh my God, you can just have this like stuff that's unsit, you know, not even planning how it's all synchronized together, but it just mm -hmm. makes this beautiful result. Like that just blew my mind that any would just write music that way, you know? Mm hmm Yeah, I I always, you know, I know that at well, I mean, classical composers, you know, all throughout history up until this day, you know, less so perhaps to this day, um, have like pretty hard established ideas about different musical systems uh I, yeah. I know cage was like and this may be like a semantics thing but he was like not into improvisation like yeah. as a concept like it very much like did not appeal to him and i wonder if you know anytime i read feldman's like writings or interviews with him i wonder if he like if he had come a little bit later, if he would have just been a free improviser. <laughs> That's interesting. That's very interesting. Right. 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 I mean, well, he, well, he, he, he did say though, he, I mean, he was talking about some of that early stuff. He was like, he did some earlier stuff. Maybe it was projections. I can't remember. It's some stuff right before durations that where it was like too indeterminate where he just had, he only indicated high or low. Like he didn't yeah. say what notes. And then he was like, and then he wrote one of those essays. He was like, "Ah, eh, that's a little too indeterminate. I do want to decide what the pitches are, you know? Right, right. So, so, um, but he might have been more open to free improvisation, you know? I mean, I don't, they, you know, you okay, know. so this is me, like, I, I've, I, I've, I've said this story publicly before, and I've heard the source of the story say it publicly. So I'm saying this secondhand, but I, I remember um, hearing Elliot Sharp tell the story, and he's, he's said this publicly, so I'm not like, talking out of turn or whatever and he studied with feldman right he studied Brooke. with feldman um at buffalo buffalo yeah and uh he did not like all aspects of feldman the man like he actually he felt he was like a blowhard and kind of a bully and you yeah. know all those things um but elliot told this story about he was giving maybe his senior recital he was giving some one of his student concerts and feldman was the the advisor and he writ he'd written this piece and within the piece there were uh some parts for improvisers um so the piece had a structure but there were specific parts that were written for or were, were for improvisers and as they were getting ready to start the concert um in particular there was like a, a conga player who was going to improvise at this one section and he said that feldman saw that the conga player didn't have any sheet music or even a music stand in front of him and feldman stopped the concert from starting asked him where the the percussionist um 
music stand was and and Elliot was like he doesn't need a music stand he's improvising and Feldman went grabbed a music stand kind of aggressively slammed it in front of the guy and said now you can start right right (laughs) yeah that goes against what he says about not caring about process you know he's saying like I don't care how it's made I care about what it is Mm -hmm. and yet in this case he cares a lot about the process of how these people are making music yeah right? well, I, you know i mean i, mean, I I'm, I'm really obsessed right now with you know and i've been texting you constantly i've been watching this documentary about michael jordan and the bulls and and one thing that's like really interesting is just you know when you see a guy like and michael jordan and and morton feldman are not the same person by any means but but see just kind of seeing yeah, feldman's it, vertical is like bullshit <laughs> But, but, you know, you see so much of, like, Michael Jordan's psychology as, like, a team leader and how he sort of, like, played all these games, um, not, not on the court, but, like, mentally, emotionally, um, with his teammates and with the people he was playing against just to sort of, like, establish the, the game that he needed to play. And, like, I always want, you know, certainly anyone in, like, any kind of leadership role does that. Um, you know, they create a social dynamic that sort of influences the outcome of whatever's happening. So, you know, I, I, I wonder, Zepp Feldman has zero rings. Um, you know, how much of that was Feldman just, like, asserting his dominance um, in right. the situation? Right, like setting the tone and stuff, Wh- which I'm not against. I mean, I don't like bullying, but I do think it's cool to, if you're running something, to maybe do a few little power moves to kind of, like, set the tone or whatever. But, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's the, maybe he was also kind of taking it to an asshole um, extent. But, uh, but yeah, I mean... Um, well, I, I suppose the idea is that if you're doing like improvising, you're going to be bringing all these licks and all these predetermined mm-hmm. things to it, which you are. I mean, that's true, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I can sort of see how I can def- I can see how you would like not how you might bristle at improvisation to an extent if you're like trying to work with, quote unquote, indeterminacy. I will say, though, Braxton laid it down um I mean, this isn't a fact, it's a perspective, but I mean, Braxton was like, you know, he loves Cage, he loves Feldman, he loves all that stuff, but he was like, he said, you know, their their allergy to the word improvisation is probably racist. That, I mean, that was just his, or at least he said, it, you know, that there's an element of that, to have that level of allergy to jazz, you know what I mean? I mean, um, I think, you know, yeah. It's a little like, simplistic, but, you know, I, well, I can I, see I mean, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't disagree, argue with, Braxton on that for you know a tenth of a second especially from the perspective of being you know a black man born in south chicago in the 40s who is like traversed the world of you know academia and and concert music um but also there's you know and feldman sort of like alludes to this in his own in his own writing is that there's like something very like imperialist about asserting oneself as a composer and like how do you there's like something like inherently just like problematic in like how like if the sound is happening anyway like who the fuck are you yeah yeah no yeah that's what's weird because he has such an alpha like um ego vibe happening but then he also believes in what you're saying that there's this thing of like having a light hand not interfering Mm -hmm. um he talks about how he accuses stockhausen of like pushing the sounds around Mm. which is absolutely what stockhausen was doing you know um or maybe in the later stuff though he gets like mystical or whatever but um I, you but, know, Stockhausen, yeah. like, I still have, like, I, I, I keep that, he, he's still in my reserve of, like, I haven't really gone deep with Stockhausen. Like, it's going to happen at some point, you know, I, I have that ready to go. It, it's hard to even go deep with him because there's just so much different stuff. I mean, it's like going, it's like getting into, like, Miles Davis or something, you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. But, um, but man, durations, mm-hmm. dude, talking about durations, okay, here's one deep thing that he says in can't remember where he says it, but something that really stuck with me is just the name of the piece. Um, He says that he's not so much into rhythm as he is into durations. So even, you know, even he's saying, you know, even not obviously in the piece durations you're dealing with this for for some reason also ties in with me in my mind to the difference between improvisation and indeterminacy like these sort of drawing lines of like defining these terms against each other to kind of like make the statement like like obviously in the piece durations right they don't have rhythms written out they just Mm -hmm. have make these notes last as long as you want so it's like indeterminate duration right Mm -hmm. but 
his vibe was that even in later pieces where he is writing down stuff, like writing down rhythms on the page, he basically is like, this looks like quote unquote rhythms, but I don't view them as rhythms. I view them as durations, you know, mm-hmm. which is like a weird, um, I think that has a lot to do, like his music to me feels that way in a lot mm-hmm. of ways, y- you know, like there is rhythmic stuff, obviously, but it doesn't, it... I, you know, I, I, you know, I'm not, um, like by any, you know, I'm not an interpreter of, of, you know, contemporary music. So I don't, I, I can't say that I could really say with any authority what you would want to see on the page if you're interpreting uh, someone's music. But I've no, like I have a couple of Feldman scores and every time I've looked at one of his scores um, for more like through, for the through compose stuff, I'm always surprised by the rhythmic markings and like how complex and detailed they are when like if in particular i'm thinking of there's this one of my favorite pieces of his is um for bass clarinet and percussion and the piece is for one bass clarinetist and two percussionists who are predominantly playing like gongs and if you look at the uh the rhythmic markings like almost every um like just the time signature changes like measure to measure and Mm -hmm. it's like it's kind of psychotic in a way you know to have like a 20 minute piece of music with like orally there's like it's pretty sparse you know it's a lot of long tones and a lot of swells but then you look at the score and it's like again every measure is like in a different time signature and it's like is that just his way of like setting a metronome mark and and measuring the amount of time between events or is he trying like i don't understand what the the motivation or the intention is with something like that well i mean yeah i i don't as far as like long pieces where the stuff where the meter is always changing every bar and super complex rhythms and you can't really tell what like you can't tell where the pulse is i mean i've done you know plenty of stuff like that i mean you know i mean stuff that doesn't sound like feldman really mm-hmm. but like you know z's stuff or whatever and then and then other stuff that is sparse um i mean i probably with that it's like yeah it is part of like measuring durations exactly but then like you're saying when it's that sparse are you really going to notice the difference between this crazy 9 over two thing you know are you really mm-hmm. gonna hear the difference between that and like just an eighth note or something like so when i think about that i'm like well okay it's only partially about measuring the time exactly but also maybe about just psychologically for the players i think to, that's what it to, is that, that that's kind of the thing of like yeah like a player um yeah like having to deal with these really complicated rhythms just gives it this edge it's like shimmering kind right of vibe right how much it sort of keeps it, the know? keeps the player on their toes and you know because yeah. i i, I I was reading this conversation between Feldman and Zanakis, and I think I don't know. Maybe they were at Darmstadt. They were some at some some you know event, and they were talking about it was the day after a, uh, a performance of one of Feldman's pieces. And Feldman, you know, expresses sort of like displeasure with the fact that it sounded like they were reading it too much. It sounded too like attached to the uh to what was on the page and it's like wait what like why did you put all that crazy shit on the page if you didn't want to hear it <laughs> yeah 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 well it's it's definitely not um yeah it's not meant to be played hyper exact i i, I remember you know peter kotick right mm-hmm. i saw something where he did like a little like an open rehearsal of him uh performing i can't remember what piece it was or rehearsing some piece where he's playing flute and he was just like dude we're not doing this exactly Feldman didn't want it exactly. This is not about rocket science here, you know, Um, which I was surprised to hear. Now, I mean, of course, these are like hyper trained classical musicians. So them doing it, quote unquote, sloppy is like still basically nailing all the the stuff by by normal people standards. But right. um, But but yeah, it's supposed to in one of these essays, he's talking about how he wants it to be. Yeah, he just wants it to be like kind of exact not totally exact it's that in between because he, he talks about in betweenness a lot mm-hmm. you know like that's one of his things and and that's something that i thought was a contra well i don't know if it's a contradiction but he keeps saying like he's against dialectics he's not into dialectics da, 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 anti-hegel and whatnot but then he does talk about these polarities of like indeterminacy versus determinate writing and he uses talks about being in between a lot Mm -hmm. So it kind of seems like he's against this thing of like reconciling opposites. You know, he's against that, like the synthesizing of a dialectic, but he's seems very into 
the tension between opposites and not reconciling them, but existing in between, you know? I mean, I can't help but, like, you know, go back to the start of the conversation and sort of say that's where I hear a lot of, like, the Jewish content in his music. And, interesting, you know, there's sort of, like, the what, what's the expression, you know, two Jews and three opinions? Like, okay. the the in, in the way that Feldman's, like, never, at least, like, in, in writing and in conversation, he's never really, like ready to commit to a system to an ideology to to like it being anything 100 percent. this is what it is you know deal it take it or leave it it's always sort of like navigating well, yeah well yeah it's it's like it's like he doesn't come down in this hard line system of what he's about but then everything he says has this uh alpha confidence of like this like talmudic quip you know mm -hmm. like it's just mm -hmm. every little thing is like this smart little thing but then it, yeah well, and the t I mean, you know, like, you know, not to to get too Jewy, you know, like it, you know, but like, what is the Talmud if it isn't like a series of questions and like a series, you know, it's like, it's almost like it's always there's more questions than answers. And yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Totally. Um, do you, I got a question regarding durations. Do you, pardon me. Um, you, have, you ever read Bergson, Henry Bergson? Mm -mm. It's like, no. um, yeah, I, I haven't read him in a while, but I, when I was getting into Feldman, I checked him out. Actually, when I was getting into Deleuze, Deleuze is really into Bergson. And um, Bergson just has this idea of duration, and um, his concept of duration or, or durance, I think he turns it into that word. It's got something to do with time, where it's like the idea is that you can't really measure time. And I, I Feldman, I know, had mentioned... He mentions Henry Bergson somewhere in like an unpublished writing that I couldn't find, mm -hmm. um, but I was searching for it. But it's like, it's basically like his thing about duration versus rhythm, like this idea that, um, yeah, that science and math can measure time, but that is just never how a person experiences time. And time mm -hmm. is always like this unbroken thing that is determine more by what you're doing in time than by time itself and like gets into this sort of non-linear like unity of time type thing um yeah mm -hmm. it's uh it, it's it's there's this spiritual thing going on with him about time and with fucking with your memory like mm -hmm. memory is big in these pieces it's huge um, and like there's sort yeah. of you know it's it's certainly you know these questions of time are always there they always exist like in an in a very abstract way um but one place and it's a big place and it's i th i think like conclusively a really important part of understanding feldman's music um and from what i can tell it's one of the few instances where he really gives like a clear answer of uh of process is when he talks about um abrash abrash oh, being yeah. You know, and it's like it's pretty well known that Feldman was, you know, really into his rug collection and that, the you know, the Persian rugs were a huge source of inspiration and, it, you know, informed a lot of what he did. But particularly Abrash, which in um, in rug making, it's you don't you, you use different little batches of vegetable dye and you don't if, you, if there's like one section of a rug that's like predominantly one color you don't do the whole color at one time you sort of do it from different batches and when you when you zoom out from it you don't see just like you know the color the color blue or the color red what you see is this like variation in time you see almost like a visual micro tonality yes and yes. it you get right away from it or sorry not from away from it but you get this like sense of time and you get that in feldman's music and i think that was really deliberate and important to him yeah yeah totally man and that's really the later stuff you know patterns yeah. in a chromatic field you hear that coptic light all that stuff you hear that in this earlier stuff um yeah let's 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 we talked about durations maybe yeah. um maybe we can go to rothko was there was there other stuff i wanted to talk about with uh with durations well you know one thing to finish up on durations um is that uh he's into um it's like he says he's you know not into systems and whatnot mm -hmm. but the actual notes that he has going like within each part are pretty deliberately picked and mm -hmm. kind of have a serialist vibe to them mm -hmm. i mean they aren't literally tone rows but um he was talking about um and someone else was talking about how harmonically it's all about canceling out. There's always, he really keeps talking about the, the negation with Feldman of like mm -hmm. negating what just happened. 
um, you know, like like negating your memory of stuff. Maybe it's and more that, like that, playing that's with like, your memory. That's like that's a, a comment typically made on like the blocks of sound or like the pitch material itself and how it uh, the the pitches relate to each other. Um, I mean both. I mean just just yeah. this general sense of of like uh, of um, I, I guess just discontinuity of a certain kind, and this mm -hmm. just this sort of sounds dying. I mean th that's this whole thing about sounds going away and like this like the sort of death of the moment before and all that. And he um, it's people were like or someone was saying like uh, I, some some of this I forget whether it's comments that I read about him or what he said himself, but. People are saying like, yeah, like even in the in the the pitches that he's using in durations or in these things, he, he picks stuff that will cancel out uh, the last moment. Mm -hmm. But it it ends up being kind of serial ish in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, he's not like repeating notes that much next to each other. I mean, he does. It's pretty chromatic, mm -hmm. you, you know. Or if he does repeat a note, it's like an octave up. So it's like. Um, just checking out durations, I'm like, it's like he had projections, right? Or whatever the piece was before where he's like, doesn't specify the notes and it's just low, medium, and high. And he's like, no, mm -hmm. no, that's no good. I want to specify it more. Yeah. You know, um, which is kind of like the improvisation, him being against improvisation. You know, he's like, mm -hmm. no, 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 I got to control. I got to like do more, uh, steer the ship a little more. And then when he steers the ship to give it the aesthetic that he wants, it ends up being kind of using atonal stuff i mean he could have had durations just be a bunch of you know like you know c major seven chords but there's a reason mm -hmm. why he didn't do that you know um he, I, yeah. you know i will say like it's so it's once you kind of like get into the zone of feldman as like just you know just as a listener you know it's like it's so hard to resist like his harmonic language it's just like i know <laughs> if you know if you play you know if you play an instrument like this it's like you just want to do it on everything <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. yeah 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 instruments with no attack it's just like you just want to yeah. go feldman so hard yeah yeah, um, yeah well you know so but talking about rothko chapel you know and this is you know kind of like a sidebar but one thing that's really um valuable to me in like my relationship with with feldman's music um and i think you know hopefully you you'll have this experience across the board with art um is that like i know i feel like i have more of a relationship with the paintings of marth rock mark rothko um because of the way i hear and understand the music and the relationship i've had with his piece over the years and you get that I have that with like several of the artists art I'm, man, I'm having a hard time with my words um, with a lot of the artists that that Feldman, you know, would reference in his work and paid homage to. And certainly I feel closer to the work of Rothko because of this music and sort of the yeah. way like I at some point my brain acclimated to sitting with the music of Feldman. It, it was very conducive to sitting with a piece like by someone like Rothko. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, man. The, the thing that's weird to me, though, is that. And this is, I guess, part of why I'm just like Rothko Chapel is like not my favorite, is just that, um, is that th that Rothko ish vibe to his music. I only hear that in the later stuff, and not really in Rothko Chapel at all. I mean, because... Rothko Chapel's pretty late. It's like seventy one, seventy two, so late ish. Yeah, yeah, but I yeah. mean, but he, but to me, the Rothko ish vibe in his music is like these long pieces that are like mm -hmm. way more static mm -hmm. and like huge in scale, you know? Yeah. Because, like, I mean, one of the things that I get from, from Rothko, not that I'm a deep visual art guy one way or the other, but um, I mean, one of the things that I get from him is just that vibe of like scale scale mm -hmm. matters you know just like the size of a blue square mm -hmm. changes the quality of the blue square like your whole experience you know and so I, I always think about feldman just these huge time scale of the later stuff you know like these like crazy like for philip gustin these like long long pieces how it's like time scale um yeah funny enough uh, uh oh charlie cut out or did i cut out Am I still here or Brett, Juan, let's just wait it out for a second. All right. This is now a solo podcast, uh, live stream. So what do you guys want to talk about? 
I'll, I'll keep going uh, until Charlie gets back. Because one, one of the things that is funny about – should I keep going? Am I on? Charlie will figure it out. Uh, well, while he figures it out, it is it is kind of funny um, that within the the realm of, of Feldman compositions, Rothko Chapel um, is almost like a pop record. Like it's five kind of short, distinct movements, um, many of which have like, or at least you know, I'm thinking specifically of the fifth movement. Um, it, it's actually got like a, a hummable memorable tune aspect to it uh so in a way to me rothko chapel you know as charlie was saying like if, if you're gonna draw direct parallels between there he is <laughs> yeah th this may this may keep happening uh, a little bit because i am not famous enough to have everything fucking dialed in uh locationally technologically etc but um uh, yes. Yeah, so sorry. No. Keep keep going. What? Uh, what? Uh, what uh, no, I was just saying that like uh, that Rothko Chapel, the Feldman piece. You know, ironically, that even though it's directly associated with the work of Rothko, it's almost like it's just a series of miniatures. Um, it's actually almost like Feldman pop. You know, and there are parts yes. Yes. of it that are like really like you can kind of hum them. I could like I could play the um, the viola melody from the fifth movement and like straight away you'd be like oh frothco chapel i like that song yeah 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 it has it has yeah i mean especially yeah the fifth the fifth movement is the last one right yeah 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 see that's that's the um yeah that's that's like the most unlike him you know of anything but i think i you know i think i might have said to you once i, I one thing about rothco chapel and now that like i'm thinking about it i don't know which um it's definitely, I think, in the first movement and the fifth movement, one of the melodies he actually wrote when he was a teenager, like age fifteen. That, that's the thing in the last, uh, yeah, the, the thing in the last movement. Pe people even always say it's he Hebraic or like somehow Jewish right. in some way. Uh, but I, then I there's an, that, but, there's right. another part that he wrote um, on the day of Stravinsky's funeral. That was sort that of like well. a direct nod and reference to Stravinsky. Who again was I think another figure that he had, you know, a semi at least like intellectually contentious relationship with. Did he? Because that, that's interesting. Because I kind of, I, I think of him as having some Stravinsky-ish elements to some extent, but um, just with the like blocks, the sort of mm -hmm. blockiness of the material, you know, a bunch of yeah. stuff for a while, and then it's suddenly some other stuff, you know, that kind yeah. of modular, modular thing. I, um, I think another really appealing aspect of Rothko Chapel to me is that like sort of um melancholic like goth thing that we are talking about like I I listen to that music and I'm like this is the sound of the soul leaving the body in a darkened room <laughs> yeah yes yes yeah I mean hey man Rothko Chapel is deep and gorgeous so don't don't get me wrong man I'm just right. talking about like it's one of my least favorites just within Feldman's Move, you know like that's that's mm. um did, did you probably mention this but just that like that the actual chords i think some of those chords the choir he said were supposed to have the quote-unquote ring of the synagogue like he like mm. deliberately deliberately something about the chords to mm -hmm. him sounded like literally just <laughs> like the room i mean i don't i yeah, don't know I, what that means to him but i mean that makes i don't know to me that makes like perfect logical sense because and again, I should I should have said said this at the beginning. I am by no means uh, a Feldman scholar. Uh, I'm just a fan. But you know that piece specifically was written for uh, a contemplative setting. Um, yeah. it, that was written to be performed in and evocative of this chapel in in Houston. That you know whose literal stated purpose is to be uh, a place of con uh, contemplation for everybody you know non-denominational a place to you know sit in a chapel and sort of be in tune you know mm -hmm. yeah 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 that's the thing though man i mean it's like it's the, yeah i guess it really is feldman miniatures which to me is it's just a whole other thing scale wise you yeah. know it's just it's a very different experience man you know like if just each of those movements were like super super long um it would be 
Like, I don't know, he's got some of those choir things, they sound like chord changes. I mean, there's only, you know, two at a time. Right. But they sound like jazzy chords. Like he's got, I like, love it. you know, and then it shifts up. It's beautiful. No, no, no. I mean, it's yeah. beautiful. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, it sounds like cadences, though. It's like very mm -hmm. different to me. I don't know. It's like. Yeah, it to me, it, it has sort of like a, um, the sound of, you know, Feldman, the composer, like kind of, you know, giving like a, a light, just like a sort of like a, like a light little toss over to you, you know, it's sort of uh -huh. like, he's like, I don't need to blow it. You know, he's like, I don't need to, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be a six hour string quartet every time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Here's That's just true. like a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess that insanely long stuff really, he did really get into that at the end. You know, I always think of him as that being his thing, but it's not like, it's not like that many pieces that he wrote that are like a million hours long, you know? But he's so annoying in that, like, <laughs> there's, I, I, he, when he was at Darmstadt in 86, uh, apparently it was like kind of controversial. He, you know, was like critical of the whole program and a lot of the people in the program were critical of him and it was just like I'm maybe sure. not, a great, yeah. not a great fit. But when they asked him, like, why did you, why is your, your, string quartet you know five hours long and he you know he says something like well that's how long uh it takes for the concord to get across the atlantic ocean like, what kind of answer is that uh-oh we lost charlie again uh brett have you you've been to rothko chapel i've never been Philip says, composing sets of that. Hey, there he is. Hey, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just keep going when I when I go. Um, but, uh, contemplative, the contemplative nature. Of, yeah, uh, yeah. So, it, so. I just, I don't know. There's, I, I think a lot of my my affinity for that piece is the fact that it's the first Feldman piece I ever I ever heard, and sort of like I just have this, like. You know, I've, I've been, I've actually been, it's funny, time is passing in such a way that I've been listening to that piece for over 20 years. So I know, I, isn't that nuts? Isn't it yeah. so crazy? It's so fucking crazy, man. You <laughs> know what? Could we talk a little bit about Webern? I'm not sure if we've even gone deep on him and like how much, you know, how important he is to you because I, I, um, I learned about Webern at pretty much the exact time that I learned about Feldman. And I know that Webern, I know Chris Jonas put me on to Webern as well and it's like if we're talking about sort of rothko yeah not so much patterns in chromatic field not so much rothko chapel but very much durations in that early stuff like webern is like the only uh aesthetic uh precursor that even seems vaguely like an aesthetic precursor to that like, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Or do you love Webern? Like, I, I mean, I love it. I, I don't have a uh, sturdy of enough relationship with Webern to make any worthwhile contributions, to be honest with you. Like, I, 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 I know, you know, I, I have, like, a good sense of, like, what he occupies in the, the yeah. world of sound and music, but I, I don't have, like, any meaningful right. comment. But he sounds critique. like generally yeah. that, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just yeah, I, don't, like, I don't feel, like, that comfortable. Yeah, it's like, like super quiet and super sparse you know what i mean so yeah i mean whatever you don't need to tangent on on weber but just, but i think one of the things that's that's important about him with this stuff well first of all because like cage and feldman met at like a webern concert right 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 like right that's right, how they right. met you know which and i think like they people, both like walked out on or something like that's that. that's the story yeah and it's like yeah. people were not <laughs> a lot of people were not feeling webern and they were just like yeah cage and feldman were like out in the outside smoking and they were like it's pretty deep, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but um, but just just the something just and I, I'm not the first one to point this out, but it just I, I I love it is how you know Webern. I mean, aesthetically, definitely a precursor, obviously a direct inspiration, but like Webern was not only you know second Viennese school serialism. But he was like the one of those serialists who like took it to the most hardcore level. Like, you know, Webern's mm -hmm. the guy that was the most systematic with the tone row. Like he wasn't mm -hmm. like, oh, I've got a little tone row. Now I'm going to like use it in this painterly way. He was like, if you analyze his stuff, it's like anal, like mm -hmm. just following the rules, you know? Mm -hmm. And so he's yeah. the guy like that, that total serialism that like inspired Stockhouse and Boulez, all those guys. Mm -hmm. 
you know, but um, but it's just kind of deep that Feldman is like influenced by Webern's aesthetic, but completely against his method. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like it's mm -hmm. it's like uh, so it's almost like uh, I don't know. It's almost like Webern like finished it. Like there's no need for more serialism or something. Yeah, you know I, I mean? think I think. Uh... I think you know something that's very admirable, admirable about about Feldman is just like I think he like had a really keen sense of like where musical movements like uh, he he kind of I think he knew when things like were ready to be done. <laughs> <laughs> I think he sort yeah. of like he 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 knew he knew he, like he was like a uh, very much like on the vanguard in a lot of ways. Uh, Charlie um, seems to have cut out again, so I'm going to show you guys something. This is a picture of Toru Takamitsu that I keep here in my office. This photograph was taken uh, by my friend, Caroline Forbes. Caroline Forbes is the uh, life and romantic partner of Evan Parker. Uh, she did this series of, of composer and performer photographs. Uh, <laughs> what was the list? Oh, I was just buying time with a picture of uh, Takamitsu that I keep in my office. Oh, oh nice. <laughs> yeah, you don't have you don't have to totally buy time, man. You can. No, it's fun. It's fun. I like that. I, want, you know. I get to pretend I'm like a yeah. stand-up comedian or something. do some stand-up. I was gonna say yeah, there's like crowd work. <laughs> crowd work. Crowd <laughs> work. Yeah, just like roast Juan. He looks so yeah. not cool. <laughs> we got like the best people in the in the chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, what was I yes. gonna say? Um, yeah, dude, could you imagine talking about the talking about stand up comedy, like the Cedar Tavern, you know, where they'd all go to like hang out? That's like one of those things. That's like Comedy Cellar in two thousand nine yeah. with like Patrice, Greg Giraldo, uh -huh. and like early Louis C.K. Like, could you imagine that hang, man? Like, I, you know, I used to work at this bar uh, when I was like twenty three, twenty four, twenty three, twenty four, twenty five. I worked at this bar on the Upper West Side called um, the West End. Which you know the, was, the I remember that yeah I played my first gig at the West End gate really <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. The, West, the West End was there for over a hundred years and it was oh, uh, famous for like two things one being a place that like anybody in New York could get get a drink it didn't matter how fake your ID was if you were ten yeah. years old if you had a fake ID you could get a beer there but more famous for being the the Columbia hangout where like all the beats hung out Kerouac and and Burroughs and Ginsburg that was like their mm -hmm. bar it was their Cedar Tavern. And I remember countless times work, had, like, working shifts at the West End and being like, oh, this is just a room where, like, drunks get chicken fingers. Like, <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> like the room doesn't mean anything without yeah. the inhabitants, you know? Or, like, or, just... me, uh, or me and 14-year-old uh, Kim Abrams playing Green Day covers, <laughs> which <laughs> happened and ruled. So. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, you got it, Tom Shad. The West End Cafe, also known yeah, as the West it. End Gate. Where Columbia totally. had its first beer. Um, <laughs> so so patterns in a chromatic field. Yeah, yeah. You want to get to patterns? Yeah. I'll tell you, the, the, the thing about this, um, not just this piece, but this whole phase of Feldman, man, is that, like, when I was saying that Feldman had such a big influence on my um, improvising, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Because this thing of, like, imperfect repetition going on for like a long time mm -hmm. you know and it's like repet like these little figures right that are like repetitive but they never repeat exactly this is something that i absolutely got from feldman and it's a thing that's like um this sense of like stasis mm -hmm. like that's something that i had never thought about in music that's why i should have mentioned that or just of like just everything his whole body of work like just getting the vibe of just things being static like i hadn't even encountered that vibe of just Did stillness you know in music before right yeah we're having some some tr uh some difficulties today uh juan do i think kim will ever get back to drums i hope so kim's a really really uh magnificent drummer um seems like it's not that uncommon for really good drummers to not want to be really good drummers, you know, not trying to speak for anyone, but it seems like 
you know, I could think of a few really great, intense, thoughtful, great drummers that, you know, sort of seem to actively resist the drum set. I don't, I don't know why. Um, here we go. You, you know why I think, um, I think we're going to be good because we just had a bunch of other internet activity in the house. Okay. But, um, but what I was going to say is this is actually important. <clears throat> I mean, relatively speaking, uh, the, uh, <laughs> like, um, yeah, just stasis, right? So like these imperfect repetitions going on and on as a way of achieving stasis and the way that that is more static than if you repeated things exactly. Yeah. Because if you start repeating things like a riff, mm -hmm. it like gains momentum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but when you, and you start to feel how many times something happened. Mm -hmm. So you repeat, some, you repeat something verbatim, you know, over and over again. It's a riff, you get momentum, and you start feeling, oh, it happened four times, it happened eight times, you start counting. With that Feldman shit, like they have in Patterns in a Chromatic Field, or in Philip Guston, or in um, Coptic Light, the imperfect repetitions where there is no one thing that's being varied. You know, there mm -hmm. isn't like a, 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 the main version of it. It's just like slightly changing. That is more static and still, you know, mm -hmm. than if it re repeated exactly. And so it's kind of like. Um, that just really influenced how like I play with you and how mm -hmm. I play with Mike and just generally what I do um, with improvising. And it kind of brought me to back to, um, you know, that Eno quote um, where he says uh, repetition is a form of change. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that kind of, that kind of inspired me because I'm like, yeah, like repetition gives this sense of change because you're going forward in time. But like, if you want to really stop time, not repeating, like some variation is necessary mm -hmm. to pull things to, to make time stop. It makes time you know stop. Saying? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, it's funny, like patterns in a chromatic field, you know, I think everyone would agree is like an incredibly uh, at least on the surface, like it's a very atypical Feldman piece. It has like more than a lot of the, it really has its own, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say logic. That feels like a very Braxton thing to say. It has like, it has like its own, like such like a distinct identity in that it's like, it's, a, it's fucking maniacal. And you know, the piece lasts. It's busier than, than most stuff. Yeah. Than most yeah, it, stuff. Yeah. It's like an hour and a half long and it never, do you feel like it's dragging? You never feel I don't feel bored for a second. I feel like no. uh, y y there's like it has so much um, like kind of like this like backward momentum that you're talking about where like there's so much uh -huh. like, repetition, but it's like not perfect repetition. So you kind of like have an idea of what's coming next, though you also have no idea what's coming next. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and you're sort of like, I don't know, maybe it's just the way we're built or, and, and conditioned as listeners, but I'm almost like terrified, like, oh, fuck, I don't know, like, what's coming around the corner. And it's like, you kind of know exactly what's coming around the corner, but it's like, it's done with like such a, like, attention to, to, to dynamics and to time that it's just like, I, I want to live in it. I don't want it to be over yeah. when it's over. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Well, yeah, because, you know, he talks about not wanting to push the sounds around but it's really that he pushes them around just very gently, you know, it's mm -hmm. like he, you do feel his hand, you know, it's not mm -hmm. like no decisions are being made, you know, like, but it's just, it's just a gentle hand, you know, on the it's, materials. You know, it's, you know, we, we were in the last couple of days sort of texting about it. Like I, I, the first um, recording of patterns in a chromatic field that I heard is the one that came out on Zodic. And I think 2004 or 2005, which to me is like the like end all be all of that piece again largely because it's probably what i heard first but it's like without question in you know in comparison to the other recordings of it that exist it's way close miked the way that the piece is executed and i'm pretty sure the editing had a lot to do with it um yeah. the way you know the 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 recorded presentation it's just like way more aggro they're not playing louder they're not they're actually adhering so um completely to the to the mark dynamics and the mark tempos 
uh, it's, but it's just like so much more assertive. Um, and it really is. It's, it, yeah, it's a little too aggro for me, honestly, but I, I can see why it's kind of cooler in a certain way, you know? Well, from like, so from an autobiographical perspective, it actually came out and I can't off the top of my head, remember which came first, but as a, a, a musical release, it came out right around the same time as the Orth Realm of record. Yes, and I yes. I got those like around the same time and those two records, you know, which are two of my favorite records of all time, really marked for me like a different way of listening to music. And Yeah, man. It would be I, I, it's very easy for me to draw parallels between the two. And I don't know if Mick is a Feldman guy. Um, he is. He is absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. Uh, but those two records, you know, I always sort of like group them together um, in my you know for for being like in my own life, just like a demarcation point where, you know, I began to hear things. Mick's not underrated. I mean, more people should be listening to Mick, but everyone that knows Mick <laughs> knows that Mick is, you know, yeah, is the yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll forever kind of hold those two pieces together. So like when I sent, like I sent you um, some other version of, of patterns and like when I hear something like that, I'm almost just like, get out of here. <laughs> get out, get yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. The the thing, I, something that that is similar to me with listening to Orthrealm. By yeah, by the way, anyone does the, the record we're talking about. The Orthrealm record is called o Av or Ov. It's like O V. Came out in two thousand five, um, and that uh, something similar with that is like these long. It's like the the these long blocks of like similar stuff, and then when it changes it's like so dramatic like the, mm -hmm. the 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 you know because you're just so tranced out in it like the the patterns in a chromatic field was just listening to it this time i i just was so struck by just w when it changes to a whole different type of thing suddenly it sounds so different like i mean it's just it sounds like a completely other piece like you know when it suddenly just everything gets low and they're doing pizzicato instead of both like you know it's like you're just it's like there's it's such just being thrown out of a window all of a sudden you know it's like there it's there's such like like a delicious narrative quality to it like the whole piece to me you really hear these two characters like it's almost like tom and jerry you know really and it, do you because i don't feel that way at all but how, how we, yeah, yeah well okay you know what, I would is, say, what are the characters like i mean i haven't like assigned you know like a, a right. story to it but the way like like uh you know like I'm, I'm thinking specifically about the the zodic one which is charles curtis playing cello which anyone out there if you don't know the playing of charles curtis like man get anything you can by charles curtis he is uh incredible cellist uh he teaches at ucsd incredibly nice guy and you know uh eliane radic he's the cellist she calls alvin lucier who you know is no longer with us but he, right, know, he would he would call um charles and so would feldman and Charles, so the way there's these just there's these sections like where you know he's kind of like he's doing those pits lines, and the there's this like kind of this weighted like thunk to these like yep. left hand on the piano, and yep. it just yep. it's it sounds almost like two boxers who are like they've been going for like ten rounds and they're just like <laughs> no no totally yeah so I take it back and I should not have interrupted you because what? when you're talking about two characters you're talking about the two instruments yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That that's what I, I kind of thought you meant like two themes that uh, no no no, uh, no, no, no. develop over time. But no 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 no. Yeah, it's no, just no, such two... a conversational piece. Yeah, no, it really is. That's the thing. Well, yeah, because it's like they're each in each each section, right? One person is playing this certain type of thing that's slowly. I mean, this is what I get from the improv stuff, man. When when yeah. when, when we play, you know, it's like yeah, they each have a, this one type of thing they're playing. It's slowly varying, but it's not really going anywhere. It's just kind of orbiting around this one type of thing. Yeah, and it just keeps lining up with each other in different weird ways, like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Feld, Feldman kind of, like, forever, like, irreparably kind of ruined my improviser's brain in that, like, <laughs> Did you it? know, I don't like, think well, so. Oh, I just mean, like, I when I hear people, you know, just doing all the crazy shit, like, I'm just like, oh, I'll, I just want to play, like, three notes over and over again, cycle them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Man, you, this is, so I, this is some stuff that I was reading about. You probably read this, too, when you were doing, uh, uh, I don't know, we were, we were, like, all, like, looking for stuff to read for this, is, like, in, in Patterns in Chromatic Field, I didn't know this, but... He actually, this is a, like a music nerd notation thing, but it has like a, it has an aesthetic vibe thing to it too. 
he notates all that stuff on the cello mm-hmm. like w- deliberately weirdly like instead of an a he has like a b double flat and instead right. of like a g he has an f double sharp but you know and, I, I feel like that's part of feldman's swagger which is like if you yeah. ask him about it he'll be like ah, you know i just like it to sound warmer you know but yeah, yeah. in actuality he's really controlling that well, well but but he he says something to that effect i mean he says like he, he says like look when you've been doing this as long as i have like the difference between a b like a like a b an a and a b double flat he's like technically there's no difference but to me it it, it, it like these intervals like when I see that on a page, it like does something to how I think it kind of should sound on this subtle, like subliminal level. And so he's like, I'm going to, I'm giving that to the cellist and it ends up sounding like microtonal and stuff totally, like totally. Be, because it, that, especially when they're doing the harmonics, cause you have to kind of slide a little bit between those. So it ends up being, you know, slippery. And, and I mean, he's talking about, what does he say? He said, when someone is asking him like, how exact is the notation? He says that, a tumbling of sorts. This is that, he's talking about tumbling, which is sick. He says, a, a tumbling of sorts happens in midair between their translation from the page and their execution. Mm-hmm. And he calls these things, quote unquote, notational images, Ugh. right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like this stuff where, yeah, like it's not like he's just messing with the performers unnecessarily. But there is this stuff where you're grappling with this weird notation and it gives you like weird results. Well, I like with that piece specifically, Feldman referred to it as a, a formalizing a disorientation of memory. Yeah, yeah, there you go. That's, 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 yeah, man. That's, you know, for the, for the listener, you know. Well, also, I think like, you know, I, I know enough about a stringed instrument, whether it's a guitar or, you know, a cello or whatever, to have like an understanding of the physicality of the instrument. And, you know, like when I hear, and again, I'm talking specifically about the Charles Curtis uh, realization of that piece, but it almost sounds like the cello has an extra like half inch of action between, you know, the strings and the... And the, and the neck, you know, where it's, it sounds like tough and rigid. It sounds like there's an extra amount of resistance that is like mm. informing the the way that the phrases pop out. Yeah, yeah. There's some like tension going on there. It's like like feels like it's I don't know string tension or like psychological it's definitely, tension or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. 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 They, they keep talking. I mean, the the people using the word shimmering. They were like, you know, music always has the shimmering quality. And, you know, people could say that as far as just the sound goes, you know, it's like a lush sound or, you know, like you would talk about like Debussy or, these, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like Mm -hmm. shimmering. But 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 they're also talking about that tension of having to, like, do these weird notational images and it gives it that edge and then not playing the stuff exactly, but kind of trying to and the stuff like not totally lining up, but being different every time. It's like it's like this feeling of shimmering, you know, not just like literally sparkly sounds, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's that, that piece is like, I mean, see, so that piece is more like, if we're talking about the rugs, like his whole mm-hmm. obsession with the, like the, the, the textiles and that thing that was, was it a, a Bosch or a brush? A brush. A brush, right? Yeah, yeah. That thing to bring it back, like you were saying earlier, that thing of like, yeah, like you, right. Like you dye part of the rug blue and then you have to make a new batch of blue dye. And it's like a little bit different than the other one. Cause you can't mm-hmm. repeat it. And then you look back and it's like, not all the same color blue. Like this piece is to me, I hear that like a lot in this one. Like that's yeah, like well, really coming through, you know, I, f- I found this quote from Feldman and this is a quote, not specifically about this piece, but about his use of patterns period. And it really kind of speaks to that. He says, the most interesting aspect for me composing exclusively with patterns is that there is not one organizational procedure more advantageous than another, perhaps because no one pattern ever takes precedence over the others. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh, man, like, yeah, there was, it's funny. Like, I saw there's this awesome, well, I don't know why did I say that. There's this, there's this, um, this video of Feldman speaking at Darmstadt and he says this really quick comment where he says uh, he always wanted as a composer he always wanted to be Fred Astaire <laughs> yeah it's like what so exactly sick. does that mean yeah it's like so sick but like you know 
it's like how I, are you going to call him on that like you're not you didn't achieve that it's like you it's so like vague you know? I, it's, it's like I, don't, I don't know though, I, I think i say that though because like he did like i want like i want to be feldman in the way like he talks about being fred it's just like such a <laughs> nash like the way he talks about music the way he constructs music it's like just with such utter panache and like the way that you know you know people say like the way you can tell a master of anything is how easy they make it look how easy yep. jordan it seems to just like fucking dunk from half court and you're like yeah you just do that you know you just do that and like the way feldman kind of like refuses to acknowledge like his formal techniques and he's just like you know patterns are beautiful yeah yeah, yeah. <sighs> no they are yeah, well, yeah, that's what's one of those stories, right? He first hangs out with Cage. Cage is like, look at this beautiful piece you wrote. You know, how did you make it? And he's like, I don't remember. And, like, Cage is just delighted, you know. He's just, yeah. like, so just, just tickled, you know, by this. Yeah. Uh, which nowadays would be like, all right, who cares? You don't know how you wrote it. But it's like, you know, back then that really was like a statement of, like, not knowing how you wrote something was like a – that was like a hardcore thing to say in like a discourse where the whole thing is about like talking about your techniques and stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember like w when I did that, that, uh, Ostrava new music days thing, or just, just doing various masterclass composer stuff with disease dudes. We always used to like laugh at this thing of like, when people are talking about like discussing your piece that people always would say, where did you get your pitches? I'm like, there's 12 of them, dude. I mean, what do you mean? Where did I get? It's like, it's already like a tiny menu. You know, where did I get them? It's like, well, I did all these graphs and charts. It's like, you can't just intuitively, like, you're such a nerd that you need more rules than just that there's 12 fucking notes. Like, it, it, it's like, you want me to hold your hand? Like, what? It's like, you know, anyway. Like, it's... You know, I got to say, man, like, I, I'm so far outside the world of classical music that, like, anytime I get, like, any glimpse into, like, how things are constructed or, you know, kind of, like, under the hood, like, I, I'm always delighted when I see, like, how much, you know, you were saying at the start of this this talk before I, before I came in about how, you know, uh, one teacher has a student and that student has a student and there's, you know, there's this lineage that, you know, in effect, you've studied with so-and-so. And I got to say, like, I, I watched Peter Kotick one time rehearse the ensemble and perform you know uh why patterns and it was which is again talk about a motherfucker of a piece but he we could have done that too yeah you know. yeah 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 uh they so th that was at the stone back when i was on avenue c and second street and i was working the door and it was um in july of 2006 in the middle of a heat wave i've told this story a million times but you know, for anyone that ever went to the Stone on Avenue C, you'll sort of like famously remember what a miserable it place it was to be in the summertime because it didn't very have hot. air conditioning and it's very small. And if it was a show that a lot of people went to, you know, it was going to be like a very rigorous experience. And I remember Peter Kotick sort of like being delighted by like the just like physical intensity of the room at, for the listening experience and it's like if anyone you know is going to know how feldman would have <laughs> wanted people to experience it, it was, it's going to be him it, it will be peter kotick man yeah dude and it, it's like it's it put me at such like i was so like bummed out that it was so hot but to hear you know to listen to the, it's like a 30 minute piece of music where things move very slow you know unsurprisingly they move very slowly and there's a lot of space a lot of quiet sounds and hearing it in that environment like i don't ever want to hear it any other way again yeah man yeah 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 coach what a g dude he like but premiered that, that, all these stock housing pieces in america yeah. and shit like in the 50s so that sick, same dude. that same concert uh he was doing they, they did a lamont young piece and Kotick was like utterly delighted. It was so so much. He made such a show of it that I was almost like not sure if it was real. But he had a um, cease and desist order that was sent to him by Lamont Young for that performance. He was like, "Look, Lamont Young legally doesn't want me to perform this tonight." <laughs> Why? Because because he didn't because he couldn't do like oversee it the way he wanted I guess, to. Or yeah, something, and, you or, know, Lamont like Young that. is like famously protective of how his music is heard, and that's deep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The, the thing is, man, the thing that we've lost, man, it, that, that, and I'm not even going to pretend that I'm the guy to bring it back or that we are, you know, because you, you're, you're born reborn, you come out of the, you know, we're, we're all <laughs> coming out of the same culture at the same time. But just imagine 
being at Darmstadt in the 50s or just even being part of this kind of thing where like your compositional methods like you believe in them to such an extent that you're willing to like get in arguments with people to the point of like friendships falling apart or like you know like fist fights and stuff like yeah. over o over like you know what i mean just people being like mm -hmm. no like that serialism shit is jive like give it up and someone being like no you're fucking lazy like you know like literally i mean now like now there's there isn't even that kind of discord is it like I, I mean we should take it back to that nerd that alpha nerd shit because now it's like classical music it's just like every piece it's like this is based on the, this stuff that happened to me in my life and like my little narrative and no one's like okay i can't argue with that you know your little <laughs> feelings and shit you know what i mean it's like <laughs> well i mean maybe that's you know that's that's definitely a place where that kind of like internal you know community critique is happening like you know i I, I'm incredibly dismissive of so much music that's happening <laughs> right now. Well, no, we hate, we, we, we hate, but we hate, but we never hate based on like, uh, like the deeper philosophy of like how the music is actually put together. I mean, I might a little bit hate on certain kind of social political attitudes or something, mm -hmm. but the, the point being, you know, like Feldman was like, I don't care about systems. I'm against these things, but that's a system. Or, being that against systems is still a hardcore position on like how things should be done you know mm -hmm. like his vibe it wasn't like hey man do whatever you want like i don't want to offend anyone you know like i mean i, I mean you know i i think like i i I've, you know i feel like you you know like myself and like a lot of people i know are gonna be like angrily dismissive of music that lacks rigor yeah music that lacks any kind of rigor i mean yeah you know yeah. If, if if you don't and that's you know maybe it's like jazz shit or whatever but like if you feel like someone is you know just sort of like not really putting their ass into it you know you know when you sort of like fuck that motherfucker yeah 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 there is yeah we do still have the concept of the no playing motherfucker like that yeah, is and th and that and is sweat equity yeah and sweat equity <laughs> sweat equity sweat equity, sweat equity. You know? i like, like it i remember that yeah 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 um, yeah, Philip, Philip says he's got an agent who's preparing a press sheet and really believes in my work. Perhaps I can change things. Shake it up, dude. Yeah. <laughs> what does that call, mean? <laughs> call people out, man. Well, yeah, lay down, lay down what, uh, lay down what you're about or do it in the discord, man. Call people out. Just be like, nah, man, your shit's, your shit's wet. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, you know, I think, I, I feel like that's, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like there's something like bubbling like like there's enough jive shit going on <laughs> on like large scale enough stage i feel like it's we're, we're about to see you know we're about to see some some aesthetic call outs like cancel well, culture well, from like an aesthetic perspective <laughs> well yeah, dude thank you i mean i mean my main yeah let's not rabbit hole on this but one okay. of my calling stuff out is that like is is that music now that is based completely on on politics and ideological narratives if if it's that and it's not deep on an aesthetic level or on some kind of other level and all you're putting into it is politics and and ideology then that shit's jive like that's i mean that is i do not give a fuck about mm -hmm. people who are making music that does not stand on its own and only stands based on a point they're trying to make Mm -hmm. You know, this is my, mm -hmm. this is my, I stand with the Ukraine, uh, fucking accordion piece. Like I, that mm -hmm. is jive like personally. So that, that's my one, that's my like polemic thing, but I'm never going to get so polemic that I'm like, you know, this is what my work is dealing with. And I'm completely not dealing with X, Y, and Z. And I have absolutely no interest in X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, it would be forced for me to lay down aesthetic criteria the way Feldman does. I mean, not that he, not that he calls anyone jive, but just where he's like, I'm this Stockhausen is some completely other shit. I'm basically not, you know, like drawing those kind of lines. Like mm -hmm. there are still, there, you know, there, there's still people around, you know, I mean, obviously they're older people, you know, so I'm, I'm sure yeah. that like you could very easily, um, you know, find some situation where someone like Steve Reich and, 
I don't know, Philip Glass would like aggressively argue about the difference in their approaches and the, you know, the difference. I mean, maybe not now because they're like, you know, a thousand years old or whatever, but, um, yeah, I, th I, th I think there's, yeah, like, yeah, perhaps like we're in a very polite period where like two great composers of rigor aren't gonna, you know, have that conversation, but maybe they also just know deep in their bones that like, there's nothing new. <laughs> like, there's like, what the fuck are you gonna argue about? Like, we're all we're doing is recycling shit. Well, that is something interesting with Feldman, man, that vibe of like progress, I mean, or not. That's some stuff I think about all the time now, man. Like, is progress real or good or desirable? Or, like, in the sense of, like, when you, um, <laughs> like, um, uh, what was I going to say? Okay. Feldman talks about how, um, like, Stockhausen and Boulez and that whole serial realm in the 50s, how they're all about the new but they're also about the new that is uh, – they're all about moving moving forward and being avant-garde, but that it's a complete continuation of history, that there's like mm -hmm. – not it's not a break mm -hmm. with history, you know, that serialism was supposed to be taking, you know, Germanic, like whatever, classical music into the 20th century, you know, and, um, and how Feldman was like, I'm not really down with that. Um, but he wasn't like, fuck tradition – he was just like, we're not trying to take classical music, you know, like, like Feldman's vibe. I think he was, he seemed to be pretty clear that, that, that what he and Cage were doing was different and new and distinctly American, but that it wasn't about like, this is the new way. Right. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, yeah. oh, this is the next step. And, and so that's kind of a thing where he's like against Hegel, like, cause Hegel would be like, you know, Hegel or into Marx, you know, this thing of like, history is just going in a certain way and we got to just go the way history is going. And this next thing is, you know, the linear progression, the teleology, you know, mm -hmm. like he was like not into that vibe. Right. Right. Yeah. He was also pretty clear that like that period of time in New York, um, I think, I think he's like specifically said it lasted three weeks. <laughs> That's <sick. laughs> Yeah, he was like he's like that magical period of time where you know uh, he literally said it lasted three weeks like, right, as right, a movement, right. you know. And I think he would be very hesitant to call anything, you know, to call that a movement, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so that's uh, that, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. What was I mean? Did you did I send you this? Uh, there's a time. I mean, I was looking at this timeline of his life and his compositions and. Mm -hmm. um, the late, late stuff, I think, what was it? Philip Gustin is like his second to last piece. Is that right? Yeah. I can't remember what year that is. Good look it it's up. It's like 87, I think. I think so. Yeah, because he, he dies in 87. Or no, yeah. I think he dies in 80, 87. 87. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He had pancreatic cancer. I think it like yeah. came and took him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. Philip Gustin, right. That's like, yeah, 86 or something. Yeah. Um, that's one of my favorites, really. But yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, like, um, oh wait, there was one thing I wanted to, oh, this is it. This quotation, I don't exactly, this might not be the deepest, but just on some like, just on, on the Jewish question, <laughs> on the level of the JQ here. The JQ. Uh, I, gotta, I gotta get into the JQ here. He, um, he says, uh, the, in that interview that you hit me to, that then I sent back to you, I, I posted this in the Discord, by the way, this this interview from 1967. A lot of what we're saying here came came from this interview. It's like, I mean, by the way, this interview, listen to this, just listen to how erudite and deep the interviewer is. Yeah. Nobody talks like this anymore. No. Just long pauses, thoughtful questions deep listening you just do anyway yeah yeah um, yeah that guy's just, amazing yeah yeah it, it's it, but um but in in that thing he's talking about the interviewer brings up this it, they're talking about how how feldman has this disdain for like systems you know and and mm -hmm. and like uh, overarching like systems and um and the and the interviewer says like yeah you know there's there's a robert frost quote that says um what was it, it like he says that um Robert Frost says he doesn't like to play tennis with the net down. 
mm-hmm. and what he mm-hmm. means. It, right? Did you read that? You heard that? Wait, right? wait, so keep, what, going, what, keep going. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, what what he means, what Frost meant was that he's he he was criticizing free verse. So he was saying, I don't like to play tennis without a net. Like I don't like to play unless there's a structure. You know, yeah. like I need structure. And he was kind of saying that it's bad not to have structure. It's bad not to have these systems and templates. You know, and um. And the guy and the interviewer was like, you know, that sort of sounds like the opposite of, of you, you know, uh, you know, Feldman, you know, you know, people who don't want to people who require systems to work, you know, like, uh, you know, what do you think of that? And Feldman goes, I, he goes, I have no final solution for these people. They're just kibitzers as far as I'm yes, concerned. Yes, yes. I wrote <laughs> and, that down. And, and, and right. No, we both love that. Yeah. And look, I know sometimes I draw. It's like stretches. But but the words people use matter. It, they matter. It, they, they matter. They matter. So it's like I don't know why at that moment he busts out Jewishness with such a. But to, you know, kibitz is like that's not like a, that, that's like very like that's really Jewish people say that. Yeah. Like that's not yeah, yeah. like some universal. That's not like, even schlep is less is more common. Right. But, um, no. So he busts that out, and man, maybe I'm just morbidly looking for shit. But he says final solution, man, which is like I, I mean. He didn't have to say that, you know what I mean? So it's no. like when he's like, when he says, I have no final solution for these people, it's like, is he, is he? <laughs> he's, is I mean, he... listen, you don't put those two words side by side and just pretend like they're, they, oh yeah, it, just, it was just word choice. No, you those... really, uh, exactly, man, exactly. So it, it, for him to use the word final solution, talking about people who like uh, require systems to, to work for artists, like is he talking about killing them all? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> so extreme. Like, but... yeah, no, I, I thought that exact same thing because when he says that, he says, "I have no final solution for these people; they're just kibitzers." It's like, okay, he is going hard in the paint on that one. He's yeah, not, he's dude, not, yeah. He's... <laughs> I mean, I mean, even even without the weird like Freudian the Holocaust slip or whatever, like just calling people kibitzers is awesome. I mean, that's 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 like I I love just being you know. It's like you're just a non-contributor. You're not, well, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's also like anyone who has even like a little bit of a second language or a comprehension of a second language in their pocket. And, you know, this is really like, you know, the Jewish thing, especially for people of his era, because, you know, you could say that Yiddish, even though you might not speak it fluently, because most people didn't at that point, it's still not your second language. It's your primary language. And so for him to sort of drop, it's just like, there's, again, there's so much panache. Like he just picked the most yeah. perfect word. He didn't, you know, he, yeah. did, he, yeah, did, yeah. he didn't say like, social climbers or you know people talking no. out their neck or anything is just this little perfect nugget yeah, kev- of dismissiveness kev- yeah. yeah 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 i like to call people yentas too there's a lot of yentas on on, on twitter but um but That's yeah what twitter is yeah twitter yeah, should just yeah. be called yenta <laughs> it's just the yenta house man yeah. um yeah i mean that was something that was something crazy in that uh in that interview i feel like i took a lot of notes on the interview but, it's uh, it's it's such like an essential listening thing. Like if you really really want to know Feldman, you know, it's I think like pretty crucial. You know, yeah. you, you don't I don't feel like you. I spent maybe um, well over ten, maybe fifteen years listening to the music of Feldman before I ever heard him speak, and I, I don't feel like I really understood anything about Feldman until I was able to sort of match these two things up. You know? Yeah, 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 like, yeah. It's not just that he had this like deep you know, this deep, deep accent and this like hilarious swagger to the way he like talked about things. It, it's like, it's really crucial. Like perhaps, you know, you could say that of any artist that like, but I think with him, it's like especially crucial yeah. to, to, to yeah, tie yeah. everything up, to, to know who this guy was in that way. Yeah. The, yeah, the gentleness of the music, but then just like the swagger, the swagger of the man. I mean, he really is like the biggie of that generation. I mean, he's just yeah. like, you know, just womanizing, just ugly, obese man, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, uh, you, you know what? I, I, I love, there was one of these things, and I'm not sure if it's in that interview, but this kind of gets into the, his disdain for systems to an extent. Is like he's talking about concentration. In one of these essays, he's talking about how he writes in pen. Mm-hmm. You know about this kind of like, and how it's just that's part of his thing of like he he's like I don't need systems I just need concentration, and that he like writes in pen 
because it's like if he if if he if he finds himself having to cross things out mm-hmm. or edit things, he's like I must not be in the zone, you know, like I'm in oh, the zone. Wow. I'm in the zone if I don't have to cross anything out and I'm just like crushing it in pen. Huh. You know, which is like, there's something kind of spiritual. I don't know, spiritual Definitely. in some way. Definitely. Oh, so you like know? a litmus test. For, I, 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 I haven't read that before. I didn't know that. Yeah. And, and I remember, <clears throat> I remember Lucier talking about, and this, I totally got what he means. It's just like a vibe thing. It's not like a specific thing, but he's talking about, he's like, he's like, look at Feldman's scores. The handwriting is so tiny and scrunched. And, and he's like, and he, and he told the thing about the pen and he's like, and he was also like, you know, he's got these shitty eyes, mm-hmm. you know, and these Coke bottle glasses, you know, and, and, yeah. and he was, and he was saying that, you know, you hear that concentration in the music and seeing it on the page and the thing with him in pen, it's like, you just get this sense that he's like, his face is like, mm-hmm. you know, like two inches away from the manuscript paper, you know, like he's just scrunched up there not looking from like a bird's eye view right you know which to me that kind of gets into this not this not being into systems where it's like systems you're like from above you got the bird's eye view you're like oh i've got my whole structure now i'm going to go into the specifics and like you know go in there when he he was just like like right up at the page like two inches away writing in pen you know what i'm saying like a a moment at a time yeah like um, and that his music kind of sounds like that. Like it's mm-hmm. from the middle, it's from the middle out. It's not from the top down. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm mm-hmm. up, I'm up in this shit. Like it's right there in my face. And then I'm like moving forward in time, but it's like, I'm always right here. I don't know. Something about that to me is like just hyper, hyper deep, you know? Yeah. And it just, it feels like, you know, I think it's also kind of like what I was saying about why I, I enjoyed lit. I want that music in here i want it in headphones i want it as close as possible to me you know i i want to like and i don't feel that way with with all music with that music i feel like i want to be in that place you're talking about which is like the page is right here you know you're just micro detail just micro detail and then it's just like sort of like luxuriating in it you know yeah man it's 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 funny because like even though like hyper, even though hyper systems type stuff is kind of out of style since the mid 20th century, you know, it's like, if I think about what music, if I compare like Stockhausen or Boulez to Feldman, and I think about like, the, if I think about the, the world now, Stockhausen, the world is so noisy and hectic and just insane mm-hmm. that it, it feels like the world is really missing the Feldman energy. I mean, that kind of still. What up, John? John Lamberton. a solo transmission again we've lost charlie i accidentally shaved a uh, big chunk of my mustache off yesterday and i feel like i look like uh, some sort of chechnyan arms dealer which is cool but might have to even this up Juan, is that an RIP to Charlie? I don't think he died. I think he's <laughs> back in the game. Only, <laughs> only to say, damn, lost four viewers, man. Uh, only, only to say that we need, uh, we it, cultivating this kind of stillness is is really necessary in life right now, man, and especially for me because it's like I, I'm thinking back in like college, like I used to sit there, or like lie, like lay, lie in bed for like three hours and like listen to Feldman, like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, when do I do that now? You know, I try to make it happen as much as possible now because th- this music is, for me, like, it it just it's it's I, I said it a minute ago. It's like a blanket. It's just so comforting for me. It's not um, it's not anything other than like for me, just absolute 
luxury. Like when I put on, you know, just like a really well made shirt that like fits every contour perfectly. You know, it's like that's how that music is. It's this is soul music to me. This is like yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if I was like sitting around a campfire with my kids, like we'd be li- <laughs> we'd be listening to Feldman. <laughs> yeah, man. But but mournful and dark and gothed out though also yeah but just comforting like, is, but you know yeah. this is like there ain't no lie in this music you know y- yeah oh god yeah this is yeah, just yeah. this is it you know <laughs> no totally I, I i hate to say it man but i gotta i gotta uh take my dogs out i gotta feed them and take them out for their walk this is this is reasonable this is yeah, a uh, this is reasonable. like this this is a two hour two hour podcast yeah man. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah yeah um I'll, I'll i'll edit out that bullshit well maybe i won't edit it out because you're probably doing good crowd work when i'm no uh, i wasn't at all when i you're you're yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. You're, 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 you're sucking floundering yeah <laughs> word man well always a pleasure man we got to do this a lot obviously i'm down anytime 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 yeah, man sick all right. all right say what's up to uh javi and pearl all right peace and love always peace man yeah, man, another great one. Another great one with Simmerman. Um, you know, I never really have a way to wrap this up at the end. I always just kind of say this. But um, yeah, again, anyone who is not on the Discord, I think everyone that was in the chat right now is also in the Discord. But anyone else who just saw this and wants to be in the Last Things Discord, uh, find me on Twitter is best, or Instagram send me a message just to tell me why uh just tell me why you want to be in it and what you hope to get out of it and uh you know just so i know you're like actually legitimately psyched and i'll send you the link and we can we can hang out in the discord all right um all right you know i also i didn't really get into uh responding to all the chats today but um I don't think there was anything super, a lot of great comments, no disrespect, a lot of great comments, but I don't think there was anything that was like, I just demanding, demanding attention, I don't think. So, uh, yeah, very good, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll probably be talking to a lot of you like very, very soon, given how extremely online we all are nowadays. All right, peace. Peace.